When I was 27, I went out with my friends one night downtown. I lived alone, and when my friend dropped me off this night, it was really late, around midnight. My friend drove off immediately, and when I was walking up to my front door, I felt very uncomfortable. I had a very strong feeling that someone was in my house. I stood at the front door and contemplated going inside and tried to convince myself that I was just being silly. The feeling was too strong and I was trying to remember if I had turned off all the lights in my house before I left. I never walk around my house and turn them all off before I leave, but this night, as I stood at the front door, every light in my house was off. I turned around and began walking away, and then turned the corner and started walking down the sidewalk. The friend who had just dropped me off lived about eight blocks away, and I decided to just walk to her house. Shortly after I had started walking, I came to the realization that someone was walking behind me. I glanced back and saw a dark shape. It looked like a really tall man. It was so late and nobody was around. I was terrified. My heart began to throb in my chest and I thought about sprinting the rest of the way, but I knew if I did, it would be very obvious that I was afraid. I couldn't bring myself to do it, but I was walking as fast as I could. I could hear the footsteps behind me and it sounded like they had sped up with me, but they weren't running. When I finally reached my friend's house, my heart dropped into my stomach when I saw that her car was not in the driveway and all her lights were off in her house as well. I turned around and the man was standing on the corner of the intersection I had just crossed, staring at me. I froze and just stared back at him. After what seemed like forever, he finally turned around and disappeared behind some bushes. I took that opportunity to run. I knew of an alternate way to get back to my house, and I didn't stop running until I got home. My front door was wide open. I worked at a pretty well-known record store in Los Angeles in the 90s. A guy in his early 20s used to come in and ask me about records a lot, and one day in conversation he let a weird detail about my life slip that I hadn't told him. I brushed it off, thinking my co-workers must have mentioned it to him since he was such a regular. About a week later I was driving home and my car broke down. It was incredibly hot and I had to walk several miles to get to a payphone which was outside an elementary school. I called a cab and hung up the phone, and after sitting a moment, the phone started to ring, so I picked it up. The person on the other end said, Bad luck about your car. Talk to me until your ride gets there. I hung up the phone, but it was definitely that guy. He had to have followed me from home, trailed me from the car, and then somehow figured out that payphone number. There weren't really cell phones at the time, but there was a gas station and a grocery store across the street. I immediately quit my job and moved back in with my parents within 48 hours. I went in to visit old friends from work a few months later, and they told me that recently, someone had been kidnapped right outside the store. I spent six months living alone in a cabin near the end of a dirt road in central New Hampshire. Nearest neighbors were a quarter mile or so up and down the road. It's an area where people definitely keep to themselves. I had all sorts of animal visitors, bears on the porch, you name it, but never random people around. One morning, I went out to my car to go to work. It was spring and we had had a late frost. On the rear window of my truck, someone had written, 
I watch you, with their finger in the frost. I never had an actual problem in the rest of my time there, but as you can imagine, that was terrifying. I live by myself, and back when I first moved into my place, I went a few weeks without installing a cat door, so I got into the bad habit of leaving the back door cracked open a little bit for my cat to go in and out, but I would usually block the sliding door with a piece of wood or a baseball bat so that it could only open about six inches or so. My house is down a long driveway, and my backyard is fenced, so I figured it would be okay short term. This particular night, I fell asleep watching a movie, and I forgot to put the baseball bat or a piece of wood in the sliding glass door. I had my curtains slightly open to let a breeze come inside, since it was a stifling hot, muggy day. I woke up within an hour, hearing a tapping coming from my window. An insistent, repetitive tapping. I snuck a look while trying to pretend to be asleep. Sure, it was a branch or something normal. No. There was a man standing outside, looking in at me. It's about this time that I remember the door is open, which is only about six feet to the left of this guy. So I have a dilemma. I can get up and see what he wants, try to bluff my way through getting that door locked, or keep pretending to sleep and risk him getting bored with being creepy and finding it open himself. He keeps tapping. For about ten minutes it felt like, but it might have been less. Eventually I decide I have to nut up and do something, so I get up and make for the back door. The guy stops tapping and meets me there. It turns out it's my neighbor. Right before I slam the door shut in his face, he says, What are you watching? I responded, uh, Inkheart, can I join you? No. I shut the door and looked out the window and watched him walk away. That was the last day that I left the door open, or slept with my curtains open for that matter. When I was about seven years old, I was home from school one day with a cold or flu. My parents were at work, and my nearly 80-year-old grandma had come over to be with me. I was in bed, and she was somewhere else in the house. The cleaning lady suddenly came into my bedroom and sat down heavily on the chair by my desk. She was breathing heavily and managed to say, Are you feeling better? before collapsing sideways onto my desk, awkwardly bashing her head, and ended up sprawled under the table with her head at a strange angle. I was terrified. I waited a moment or two, and then approached her, just in time to hear what I much later learned was called the death rattle. Some vomit came out of her mouth. I ran to call for my grandma. She came in and very quickly bundled me off to a neighbor's house where I stayed until the end of the day. I knew that she had died, but my parents pretended for at least ten years that she had just fainted. It was pretty harrowing, and I moved out of that room fairly quickly afterwards. My little brother moved into it. He was far too young to grasp what happened. I can still see her falling, so awkwardly and disturbing. I remember the noise that she made. It was incredibly disturbing. Years ago, my parents had their garage converted into an extra-large bedroom, and this was where we all played games. I was about ten, and it was only the second or third time I had been left alone in the house while my siblings were all away for one reason or another. Naturally, I was up all night playing PS2, having a blast. I don't know how late, but pretty late into it, 
I suddenly started to hear tapping on the window. I didn't realize it was a sound not produced by my game for a full minute or so, and the sound, like someone drumming their fingers, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, it kept going without stopping. I finally really noticed it when the doorknob rattled and the sound moved to the door, which made it louder. I freaked out and snuck over to the door to double check the locks. They were both unlocked, but the door tended to jam and it was hard to open unless you messed with it. I locked both locks loudly so the person would know they definitely couldn't get in. But then I heard a gruff older man laugh and then the tapping sound got louder. Right outside the window I heard, Let me in. I turned out the light, ran to my room, and hid in the pitch black darkness until my parents got home a few hours later. I told them what happened, and we looked all around, but there was nobody outside, no one in the house, and nothing like this ever happened again. I have no idea who was outside that night, but I'm still afraid that they might return someday, when I'm home alone. Last year I was renting a house in a small, economically depressed old mining town in Appalachia. I lived alone. On one of the first warm nights of spring, I awoke at around 4 a.m. to the sound of my doorknob turning. I figured someone must have the wrong address, but it kept turning, persistently. I didn't have a peephole or a window to see who was outside, so I just approached the door from inside and yelled, You have the wrong house! Then the door started shaking violently and something began to slam against it. I tried one last time. You have the wrong house. I heard someone on the other side make a noise and then started screaming and shrieking like a wild animal. I grabbed a kitchen knife and called the police. About ten minutes later there was a knock on the door. I opened it cautiously to see an officer who questioned me about the incident. Then he asked me to close the door again and remain inside. I couldn't see what was happening out there, so I just turned out the lights and waited quietly with knife in hand. For about twenty minutes, it was dead silent. Then, out of nowhere, my living room window screen started to get pushed in and the curtain started to move. Someone was climbing into the living room. I held up the knife and yelled, Get out! in my most threatening voice possible. Thankfully, I immediately heard after that, Get on the ground! Show me your hands! I heard another horrible wail from outside as the guy was presumably tackled and taken to a police car. A few minutes later, another knock at the door. The officer was back to tell me that the suspect had been captured. This guy was a uniformed cop, but he was visibly trembling and super pale. I could tell that he was really shaken up. I had never seen what the intruder looked like. The next day, I ran into that same officer while he was off duty, as the town that I lived in was very small, and he told me that the suspect had told them that his name was Jason Voorhees. Probably a meth addict or some other type of drug user. Those habits don't go well with delusions involving slasher film characters. Over this past summer, I was living alone in my apartment in a relatively safe college town. I was always paranoid and locked the door any time I got home from somewhere, especially since I'm a female living somewhere alone. One morning, I woke up to go to the bathroom and as I'm in there, I hear the front door creak open. 
Obviously scared, I carefully leave the bathroom and look around the corner to see the front door open about six inches. I slowly check the apartment for intruders, only to find nothing. Somehow the door was unlocked while I was sleeping and opened by what I choose to call the wind. Needless to say, for the rest of the time I was alone in that apartment, I had a knife close by. One night I was waiting for something to finish in the oven, so I started washing dishes. Once my food was cooked, I sat in front of the TV to eat dinner. I live about 15 miles out of town and don't have any close neighbors. I could hear what sounded like a truck idling outside, but it sounded distant enough that it didn't bother me, and I didn't pay much attention to it. Because I'm in the middle of nowhere, sound travels really easily. Sometimes something that's a mile away sounds like it's pretty close, and vice versa. It idled for about five to ten minutes, and then sounded like it was slowly driving away, then briefly stopping, and then slowly driving off again. I have a really long driveway, about a third of a mile, so it sounded like someone drove down my driveway, and then turned back onto the road, and drove off. Whatever. I didn't pay much attention to it. After dinner, I went back to finish the dishes, and I had no water. The only thing I could think of was that maybe the breaker had tripped for the well. On the pole outside, there's a breaker box that only has a couple of switches, and a main switch. The smaller switches control the well pump and an outlet. The main line to the house isn't on that switch. It goes to the breaker box inside the house. I get to the breaker box outside, and the door is open, and the main breaker is off. So the noise that I heard was a truck right outside my house, and someone switched off the breaker and was waiting outside. They must have thought that it would shut off power to the house, and I would come outside to investigate. I locked my gate for the night, and then again when I left for work that next morning. It rained most of the day and when I got home, I could see where someone had pulled up to the gate, found it locked, and then did a three-point turn around in my driveway. I locked my gate at night for a long time after that, but I always lock it when I'm away, and now I always keep a 357 handy in my house. So it was early evening after the sun had gone down, and I was downstairs in the living room watching TV. My brother was up in our bedroom reading. At some point, this really uncomfortable feeling came over me, and I felt like my brother needed my help. I went upstairs, and our bedroom at the time was at the end of the hallway. As I walked down the hallway, and I'm standing right outside our door, I reach for the door handle and then I hear someone say, I have to leave now. I opened the door, and my brother looked at me and said, Someone was just outside my window. They just said that they had to leave. I asked my brother if he was talking to the person, and he said no. The only thing that they said was that they had to leave. We were both really creeped out, and we told our mom what happened, but nothing ever came of it. For a long time, I thought I had dreamt this, but a few years ago, my brother asked me, Hey, do you remember that one time when we were kids and someone was outside the window? Remember how he left right when you came in the room? What the hell was that? Because he remembered it exactly the way I do, I know that it really happened. Once, when I was around 12 years old, I was home alone and taking a bath. I was rinsing my hair underwater, and when I lifted my head, 
I realized I could suddenly hear what sounded like footsteps walking around outside the room in my house. Both of my parents were at work, and I knew it was far too early for them to be home, so I was completely freaked out and convinced that someone had broken into my house and was walking around looking to steal things, or maybe something worse. I had no idea what to do. I was so scared. I sat in the bath, naked, with no phone or any method of calling or doing anything. I was thinking that surely, eventually, the intruders were going to find me, or even worse, they knew that I was in there and was waiting for me to come out. Surely they would know. They must have heard the noise of the water in the bathtub. I sat there frozen and panicked for who knows how long before I decided to have a moment of bravery. I figured that I had to do something, so I waited for the noise of them walking around to stop. I got out of the bathtub, dried off and got dressed. I opened the door and looked around and waited. I did not hear anything after that. And from my vantage point, I could see the hallway and the entrance to every bedroom. When I eventually built up the courage to look around the house, nobody was there. I have no idea what the hell happened, but somebody was in my house. I called both of my parents and they were both still at work. I moved into my place a couple years ago. Two weeks after I moved in, I found a little flower necklace in my mailbox one day. I didn't think anything of it. I thought maybe a kid had put it in there or something. The next day I came home, and there was a pair of female sunglasses in the mailbox. Along with it was a note that read, Hey, I think you would look good in these. You should wear them the next time we're together. I thought clearly this person probably thinks I'm someone else. So again, I ignore it. Three days later I come home and check my mail again, expecting there to be something. But there's not. I head up to my front door, and there's a pair of women's underwear hanging on the doorknob. Okay, now I'm feeling uncomfortable. I still tried to tell myself that it was just a misunderstanding, so I wrote a note and put it on my front door that basically said, Hey, I don't know who you are, but you need to stop. I'm not who you think I am, and I'm not interested. Then after that, nothing else. About one year later, I came home again and opened my mailbox. There was another flower necklace, identical to the one that was left in there a year earlier. Before my husband and I were married with good jobs, we were young and poor and didn't care where we lived. We rented out a shitty little house behind the landlord's house that was clearly a shed, poorly transformed into a small studio space. At the time, I worked late nights and my husband worked mornings, so I would sleep until around 12 and work all night. The landlord, Greg, was this bald old man with a heavy Russian accent. He was kind of odd, but seemed nice. So was his wife. He had made odd comments and would FaceTime me and invite me into his house. When we first moved in, I kept waking up with a disturbing feeling when I should have been exhausted. I would feel so nervous that I would get up to check the doors and make sure no one was inside. One week, my husband went away to visit his father, and I was alone and literally felt like I was constantly being watched. The bedroom window was back in the yard, and it was heavily wooded. I would hear crunching of leaves and footsteps all the time. My husband said I was being paranoid because I was alone, and I thought so too. But then, that same week my husband was away, I offered to watch my friend's dog. 
So I get home from work around 2 a.m. and I get in bed and fall asleep around 3 or 4 a.m. I woke up shortly after that to the dog barking and growling like crazy. Now, because the space was similar to a studio, we had no doors on anything besides the bathroom. I sprung out of bed, and I see Greg the landlord standing in the living room, hand on the front door, just frozen. He was caught off guard by the dog, and I yelled, What the hell are you doing in here? He quickly apologized and walked out. When I woke up completely from my sleepy days, I realized maybe this wasn't a one-time thing. I took a shower, got dressed, and walked up to their house. Greg's car wasn't in the driveway, but his wife was home. I told her what happened and asked why Greg would use his keys to go in the house without giving me notice. She was nonchalant about it and replied, It's his house, he can do what he wants. I flipped out on her. Clearly this was happening often, and the eerie feeling I was getting, I'm 100% sure was Greg coming in the house and watching me sleep. My grandmother used to work at a mental illness facility when I was little. It was a place prisoners went after committing crimes that were so horrific they were deemed very mentally unstable and not suitable for a prison. One of her patients, who was very fond of her, was put into this place because he had strangled his mom and dad one night, hid their bodies under the floorboards, and every now and then brought his mother's body up to have sex with it. He was caught after a few months because the smell of rotting corpses had reached the neighbor's houses. My grandmother lived within walking distance from this facility, and so the prisoners that were deemed well enough to roam around the grounds were able to see her walking home. One of the patients must have told the one that was fond of my grandmother where she lived because one night he escaped and was skulking around my grandmother's house in the dark, trying to find a way inside. Eventually she saw somebody outside the window and called the police. He was caught and brought back to the facility. Nothing else ever happened, and the man never escaped again. But imagine if he had gotten inside of her house. When I was 19 and my best friend was 20, we were driving back to my house after visiting someone at work. We were on a somewhat busy road. It was getting dark, but wasn't completely dark yet. There were street lights and business lights everywhere, so visibility was still very good. This road was three lanes in each direction, and there was a concrete median dividing the traffic. I was in the left lane next to the median, and a traffic light was coming up. I saw a man standing in the median next to the crosswalk up ahead. It instantly made me nervous. As soon as I was passing him, he stepped out into the street. My best friend and I both instantly braced for impact and I slammed on my brakes. But we didn't hit him, and because there was a car to my right, I wasn't able to swerve out of my lane to avoid hitting the man. I didn't turn the car at all. I looked in my rearview mirror, and there wasn't anyone there. I had come to a complete stop, and we physically turned around in our seats to see how he had jumped out of the way. There was no one there, and no way that he could have ran off or hidden anywhere that fast. We both turned toward each other and almost in sync asked each other, Did you see that? We both saw the same exact thing. A man. We couldn't describe his face and both of us remember being confused because he was wearing a white robe, or that's what it looked like, and both of us being terrified because he stepped out into the street right in front of the car, like he was committing suicide. I had my baby in the back seat. She was three months old. She had been crying right before this happened, and then went completely silent when we came to a screeching stop, which added to the weirdness of all of it. 
We still bring it up occasionally, and neither of us can come up with an explanation for what we saw, other than something supernatural. Also, we both saw the white cloth fling across the windshield like we hit the man. But there was no impact. Nothing. It was like he just went through the car. Spring break of 2010, my buddies and I decided to camp out on an island at a local lake. One night, as we are cooking food and drinking beer, a canoe floats by with one guy in it. He asks us how we're doing and we invite him to our island for grilled meat and beers. Being in South Arkansas, we naturally assume that everyone is friendly and wants to hang out. His name was Kurt and he was super friendly but really seemed to be sad. We asked him what was up and he replied, oh, oh, nothing really. It's just that my friends are probably worried about me. He looked at me and winked. They'll find out soon enough. That still haunts me to this day. Everyone liked Kurt and, noticing that it was getting dark and he had been drinking, we offered to let him stay with us that night. He declined, saying that he had to get where he was going and he seemed very adamant about that. I asked where he was headed, thinking maybe we could give him a ride on a jet ski or something. Kurt ignored the question and said, <laughs> You boys don't know how lucky you are. He hopped in his canoe and left. We didn't think much about it. The next morning, we woke up early to do some fishing. As we're fishing, a police boat pulls up. The officer asks if we're part of the search party that found the body. We obviously had no clue what he was talking about, so he tells us a story about a young man in a canoe that disappeared last week. Apparently, divers found his body at the bottom of the lake two days before. The young man's name was Kurt Clark. This was so freaky for us that we all packed up and left camp that day. I had three really good friends and their names were Kevin, Ryan, and Tommy. Every summer, our parents would take us on vacation. We always stayed in a remote cabin in the forest of Minnesota. The cabin was located on a large island in the middle of Lake Vermilion. Eventually, when we were old enough, our parents would let us go to the cabin on our own for the first time. When we got there, we parked the car on a gravel road beside the lake. Then, we had to take a boat across the lake about a half mile to reach the cabin. There were a few other cabins on the island, but they were all at least a half a mile away. The cabin was quite small. It only had a kitchen, a bathroom, and two bedrooms. At night, it was pitch black. There were no street lights for miles and the only light came from the moon. There were no curtains on the windows. So when you were sleeping there at night, you could see the moon shining down on the trees and the lake outside. On the third night of our trip, we set up a campfire by the edge of the lake. The moon was full and the pale white glow was shimmering across the lake. We were gazing up at the stars when all of a sudden we heard a splashing sound, as if something was moving about on the water. Ryan suddenly stood up and pointed. What the hell is that? We all looked in the direction he was pointing, peering into the darkness. After a while, I could make out what he was pointing at. I'll never forget the feeling of terror that came over me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and goosebumps appeared everywhere on my arms. I was paralyzed with fear. Out in the middle of the lake, there was a woman's head. 
It was just floating there on the surface of the water, staring directly at us. She had pale white skin and long black hair that was matted across her face. The rest of her was submerged or not even there. We tried to tell ourselves it was just a loon. There are black and white birds that hunt at night, diving deep into the water. It didn't look like a loon. But that's what we tried to convince ourselves it was. We threw some more wood on the fire and tried to forget all about it. But it still gave me the creeps. About an hour later, I had to use the bathroom so I walked down to the edge of the dock and peed into the lake. Looking out over the moonlit lake, I noticed the thing was still there. But now it was much closer. It still looked like a woman's head and it still seemed to be staring right at me. Its face was extremely pale still, as if it hadn't been out in the sun for years and I could easily make out some facial features, the eyes and the nose. A feeling of incredible unease came over me as I realized it couldn't be a loon. There was no way a loon could tread water for that length of time. There were no ripples around it either. It wasn't moving at all. It was just standing there, stiff as a board, submerged in the water. I immediately zipped up my pants and ran back up to the dock where my friends were sitting around the campfire. I told them what I had seen, but none of them dared to go down to the dock to take a closer look. We tried to tell ourselves it was just a log or a tree branch jutting out of the water. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy too. None of us really believed that. We went back into the cabin and shut the door, locking it behind us. It was very late and we needed to sleep. None of us mentioned the thing in the lake. We were all trying to just avoid talking about it. There were no curtains on the windows. And as I was getting ready for bed, I couldn't help but taking one last look. Peering out the window, I could see the lake clearly, illuminated by the full moon. But the thing wasn't there anymore. It had completely vanished. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking the log must have floated away or else it just sank below the surface. Or perhaps maybe it had been a loon after all and it had just finally flown away. It was very hot that night and we had to sleep with the windows open. My friend Tommy and I slept in one bedroom and my two other friends Kevin and Ryan slept in the other bedroom. We left our bedroom doors open. I was finding it hard to sleep. It was the middle of the summer and there wasn't even a slight breeze. The heat was stifling. As I lay there, I thought I could hear someone walking around outside the cabin. I kept my eyes tightly shut and tried to tell myself it was just my imagination. It sounded like someone with bare wet feet pacing back and forth. I was trembling with fear, but I felt so weak I couldn't move. The footsteps sounded like they were walking up the steps to the cabin door. I wanted to shout out to my friends, but I was frozen in terror. Then, the footsteps turned around and sounded like they were running down the steps and towards the lake. After a while, the footsteps faded away and there was only silence. I reached over and shook my friend Tommy. He was already awake and he claimed he had heard the footsteps as well. Just then, I was startled to see my friend Ryan come running up into the room. When he stepped into the moonlight, I could see his face and the expression on it. It was very disturbing. We need to leave. He said. Why? I asked. What did you hear? Let's just go. Let's get to the boat. It's time to go. He wouldn't answer. He just ran back into his room. We followed him and found Kevin sitting on his bed, already packing up his things. Ryan was running around, frantically grabbing his stuff and stuffing it into a bag. What's wrong? Ryan, what the hell is wrong with you? Tell us. He just stopped in his tracks and stared at me. 
There was a haunted look in his eyes. I will never forget what he said. He told us he was turning over in his bed to get more comfortable when he suddenly saw at the top right corner of his window someone was peeking in. As soon as he set his eyes on it, the face vanished. He said all he saw was long black hair hanging down the window, ghostly white skin and one large eye staring at him. When he said that, it chilled us to the bone. We realized that if the face was in the top right corner of the window, that meant whatever was out there had to be at least eight feet tall or just floating in midair. I felt like I was going to be sick. Let's just go now. Let's just go now. Ryan said. We all agreed and packed our stuff as quickly as we could. We grabbed our bags and ran out of the cabin. Only thing we had to do was lock the door behind us. As we scrambled down the front steps, I glanced to the side and saw the footprints. Bare wet footprints in the dirt all around the cabin. We ran down to the boat and threw our stuff in. We untied the boat from the dock and sped off. I looked back over my shoulder and I stared at the island, but I didn't see anything moving. However, I had the strangest feeling that someone or something was watching us. When we finally reached the other side of the lake, we tied up the boat, stuffed our backpacks in the car and drove off. We had been driving for about 10 minutes when, out of the blue, Ryan suddenly broke down sobbing. What was it guys? Oh god, what did I see? On the way, we called our parents to tell them what had happened. Ryan was freaking out and we didn't know what to do. They told us to just get home safely and quickly. My friend's dad went up to the cabin a few days later and said he saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, he did mention that there were bare, wet footprints all around the cabin, which he thought was odd. Whatever Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping and ended up having to go to therapy. They gave him some pills to calm him down and allow him to get a decent night's sleep. As time went on, he recovered and ended up being fine. But to this day, he still can't sleep unless the curtains on his windows are completely shut. To this day, I still cannot explain what we saw in the lake that night. I personally never went back to the cabin, but my friends Tommy and Kevin have both gone back and everything was fine. But Ryan refuses to go back and frankly, I'm with him. You know how, on Halloween night, people always gather around the campfire and tell scary stories about strange things lurking in the woods and nobody believes them? Well, sometimes those stories are true. Last year, just before Halloween, I was at home watching TV when I heard a knock on the front door. When I went to answer it, I found a dog standing on the front porch. I looked around, but I couldn't see the owner anywhere. The dog seemed to be lost. I wasn't sure what breed he was, but he looked like a Siberian Husky. His tongue was hanging out and he was panting like he was thirsty. So I put a bowl of water out for him. The dog lapped it up greedily. Ever since I was a little girl, I had always wanted a pet dog but my parents would never allow me to have one. I didn't want to bring him inside the house, so I put him in the backyard. I gave him some leftovers to eat, but he just turned up his nose at them and refused to touch anything. That evening, when my parents came home, I told them about the lost dog. At first, they told me I would have to get rid of it, but after much begging and pleading, they told me I could keep it. However, they didn't want it inside the house. My mother was allergic to dogs. The dog slept in the garden shed, 
In the middle of the night, I woke up and looked out my bedroom window. I could see the dog's glowing eyes in the darkness. It seemed like he was just standing there, staring up at me. It gave me a very eerie feeling. The next day was Halloween. In the morning, I went to the store and bought a can of dog food. When I got home, I opened it and put it into a bowl. The dog looked very hungry, but he refused to eat the dog food. I couldn't understand what was wrong with him. That evening, little kids were running up and down the street, dressed in their Halloween costumes. It kind of made me wish I wasn't too old for trick-or-treating. I decided to take the dog for a walk in the forest behind our house. After a while, we came across a group of three teenage girls who were camping in the forest. They were planning to have a Halloween party in the woods and they had brought some food and drinks with them. The girls were around the same age as me, so we chatted for a while. They asked me if I'd like to join them. One of the girls tried to pet the dog, but he just growled at her. He didn't seem to like being touched by anyone. They were having trouble pitching their tent, so I decided to help them. Between the four of us, we managed to set up the tent. I looked around and realized my dog was nowhere to be seen. I asked the girls to help me look for him. By now. It was dark and the stars were out. The moon was pale and full and the wind was whistling through the trees. We decided to split up into two groups. The first two girls went off together and I paired up with the third girl. We spent a long time looking for my dog, but there was no sign of it. Eventually, we gave up and started back towards the tent. Suddenly, we heard shouts and high-pitched screams echoing through the trees. We ran all the way back to the tent and when we got there, we found the other two girls lying in a pool of blood. They were terribly injured. One of the girls was unconscious and the other was barely clinging to life. I asked her what happened and she managed to choke out a few words. She grabbed my arm and stared at me, her eyes wide with fear. She said they had been attacked by some sort of monstrous creature that emerged from the woods. I tried to ask her more questions, but her grip on my arm slowly relaxed and she died. The third girl burst into tears and couldn't stop trembling. We looked at each other in disbelief. Neither of us knew what to do. We were terrified, but we didn't want to leave the dead girls lying out there in the grass. We decided to carry them into the tent to protect them from being eaten by wild animals. As we crouched inside the tent, desperately trying to think of what to do, we suddenly heard strange noises outside. For a minute, I didn't know if the sounds were real or if it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. It sounded like a dog yelping in pain. I was worried that it was my dog and he might be injured. Working up my courage, I decided to go outside to see where the noises were coming from. The girl didn't want me to leave her alone, but I assured her I would be right back. Cautiously, I slipped out of the tent and searched the clearing. I crept up to the tree line and peered into the forest, but I couldn't see anything. The night was still and eerily silent. All I could hear was the soft whistling of the wind. When I went back to the tent, I was horrified to find it completely destroyed. Inside, the third girl lay dead. Her body had been ripped apart and partially devoured. A wave of fear washed over me and I felt weak at the knees. Afraid to stay out in the forest for a moment longer. I took off running through the trees and I didn't stop until I got to the safety of my house. My parents asked me what was wrong and when I told them the horrible story, they called the police. 
Soon, there were flashing lights in our driveway and two police officers were questioning me about what had happened. They went out into the woods and found the dead bodies of the three girls lying in the tent. They didn't find my dog anywhere. The policemen said they must have been attacked by wild animals and told me I was lucky to be alive. They said my dog had probably been eaten by wild animals as well. The next morning, I was out in the backyard when I got the strangest feeling that I was being watched. When I looked up, I saw my dog standing at the forest edge. He was just standing there, staring at me. Then, he did something that terrified me. He stood up on his hind legs, turned around and walked back into the forest. I never saw him again. The lost dog is still out in those woods. Now and then, somebody spots him lurking in the trees. Whenever there is a full moon, I go around our house, making sure all the doors and windows are securely locked. Then, I lie in bed and pray for morning to arrive. I was driving through the California desert on my way to New Mexico. Taking a shortcut, I found myself all alone on a two-lane road driving through the desolate landscape. There was nothing for miles, except for an abandoned ghost town. At the time, I had heard rumors that the area was a hotspot for satanic group activity. It was late in the evening and the sun was setting. Soon it would be dark. I was driving through the canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I noticed something in the middle of the road, blocking my path. As I came closer, I slowed down to a crawl. There was a truck stopped sideways across both lanes on the road. There was an open suitcase and clothes were scattered everywhere. Two bodies lay face down in the road. There was a man and a woman and they appeared to be dead. I stopped a hundred feet or so from the scene of the accident. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up. Something was very wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on what exactly it was. I reached into the back seat and pulled out my rifle, putting a round into the chamber. Then it hit me. The scene of the accident looked too perfect, like if it was staged. Was it some type of ambush? Or was I just being paranoid? I broke out into a cold sweat. My heart was pounding in my chest. Something was seriously wrong. I didn't dare get out of my car. As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive. I could pass the body of the man lying in the road on the left, then swerve to the right side and pass the body of the woman. I dropped it into first gear, punched the engine and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the truck without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a hundred feet and then I slowed down so I could take a breath and let my heart slow down. As I looked in the rearview mirror, I suddenly realized that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and at least twenty shadowy figures were emerging from the tall grass on either side of the road. At that moment, I began to panic. My right foot stepped on the gas and I sped off down the road. I didn't let up until I had to slow down when I reached the highway. I will never know what would have happened to me if I had gotten out of the car to check on the bodies, or if I had stopped my car closer to them. Somehow, I don't think it would have been good for me. Sometimes real life can be scarier than any horror movie. In the winter of 1935, there was a harsh blizzard in a small village in Japan. A cold wind was sweeping through the houses. The snow was falling heavily on the roofs and a family of five lay asleep in their beds, unaware that they were about to receive a very strange visitor. 
Just after midnight, they were awoken from their peaceful slumber by a loud knock at the front door. The father and mother got out of bed and went to answer it. While the children stumbled out of their bedrooms, wondering who could be disturbing them at this time of night. When the father opened the door, he found a stranger standing outside. The man was covered from head to toe in a long red cape. He was holding up a lantern and his face was hidden in the shadow of his red hood. I have been sent by your relatives, said the man. Your mother has been struck down by sudden illness, and her condition is very serious. She wants to see you before she dies. The husband hurriedly dressed and, after kissing his wife and children goodbye, he left with the man in the red cape. Together, they set out on the journey to his mother's house, which lay in a neighboring village. His wife waited anxiously for him to return while the children went back to bed. A couple of hours passed and there was another loud knock on the door. When the mother answered it, she was surprised to see the man in the red cape again. Your husband sent me back to fetch you, he said. His mother's condition is getting worse. It is very likely that she will not last until the morning. He said he needs you by his side when the time comes. Just as her husband had done before her, the wife didn't waste any time and quickly got dressed. She took her children to the house of her neighbor, a middle-aged woman, and asked her to take care of them while she was away. With that, she said her goodbyes and followed the man in the red cape out into the snowy night. About an hour or two later, there was a loud knock at the door of the neighbor's house. The man in the red cape was waiting outside and he asked to speak to the children. I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but your grandmother has passed away. He said. Your parents told me to come back and pick you up. They're waiting for you at your grandmother's house. The children were about to leave with the strange man when the neighbor grew suspicious and stopped them. She stood in the doorway and refused to let them go. You can't take children out on a night like this. She told the man sternly. We're in the middle of a blizzard. They'll catch their death of cold. There'll be enough time tomorrow. If their grandmother is dead tonight, she'll still be dead in the morning. The man in the red cape kept insisting, but the neighbor was a stubborn woman and refused to budge an inch. The man wouldn't take no for an answer, but when the neighbor grabbed her broom and threatened to beat him within an inch of his life, he reluctantly gave up and walked off into the driving snow. The next morning, the countryside was covered in a thick blanket of snow. An old man got up early and despite the cold weather, he decided to go out for a walk. As he was crossing the long wooden bridge that lay at the entrance to the village, he noticed something strange. There were some bright red patches in the snow. Looking closer, he was horrified when he realized that they were blood stains. Leaning against the railing of the bridge was a bloody axe. The old man grew frightened. The signs were unmistakable. There had been a murder. He hurried to the police station in the center of the village and reported everything he had found. The police searched the area and found the bodies of the missing father and mother floating in the river. They had been brutally slaughtered and their heads had been chopped off with an axe. After talking to their children and the neighbor, the police were in no doubt as to who was responsible. The mysterious man in the red cape had to be the killer, and it was clear that he had been trying to lure the children into going with him as well. If the neighbor woman hadn't stepped in when she did, the evil man would have murdered the children too. This incident was a major event at the time, and it shook the residents of the little village to their very core. None of them would ever again feel safe in their beds at night. The police never managed to discover the identity of the man in the red cape, and the case remains unsolved to this day. Nobody ever got a good look at his face that night, 
and the strange visitor disappeared into the night as suddenly and as mysteriously as he had arrived. This happened last night. I had just fallen asleep. I hear my dog outside losing his mind, only to be followed with a notification on my phone. There is motion at your front door. I open my phone to the live view of what's happening, only to be greeted by an eyeball directly in front of the camera and a man whispering and mumbling to himself. He proceeded to knock and ding the doorbell. Now I live in the suburbs, quiet town, wholesome neighbors, all good people. Luckily, I decided to lock my door today. He then begins trying his luck at the doorknob and the window. Standing off to the side, all the while I hear mumbling and whispers. After my significant other lets him know that we're going to call the police, he gets all huffy and puffy and says he was just looking for his dog, Fido, by trying to enter my house. About three months ago, my wife, then fiance, and I were driving from Oregon to Arizona. We were in a part of Nevada that was in the middle of nowhere. We were on the end of the 70 mile stretch with no cell service and it was midnight. My wife is a small girl, only 5'1", 100 pounds. It was my wife's turn to drive at this point. So I reclined in my seat out of view, sleeping. She shakes me awake and says, this guy, this guy has been following me on my tail for a while. I don't know what his issue is. I glance behind us and see a big F-350 only about 10 feet behind us. I tell her to speed up, figuring he just wanted us to go faster, but he keeps at the same distance from us. All of a sudden he shoots into the oncoming lane and overtakes us, then proceeds to slow in front of us, bringing his speed and our speed to only 10 miles per hour. She backs off a considerable distance when he slams on his brakes and starts opening his door. At this point I sit all the way up. I'm a pretty big guy and roll my window down. He spots me, slams his door shut and takes off. I'm not the one to jump to conclusions but I feel that if he didn't see me he would have definitely tried to take my wife. It shook us up pretty bad and at the next gas station we found the tenant called it in. Luckily I had got his plate numbers. And that's why you don't drive in the middle of nowhere alone in the middle of the night. You never know who's out there. So this happened on Monday night. My dog woke me up about 1 a.m. whimpering like he does when he needs to go outside. I get up to take him downstairs and as soon as I open the back door I hear someone screaming. I live in a really quiet neighborhood and it's rare to hear anything at all at night. So this was totally out of the ordinary. The woman, it sounded female, stops screaming and my dog looks at me like what the? But then hear a guy shout something sounds like boo 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 repeatedly for a few seconds. You think it was no, 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 but I definitely sounded like boo instead. I was really getting a creepy vibe off of this, and I felt like I was being watched, which freaked me out too. Not least because it was so quiet where I live, and so hot that I hadn't put on any clothes. So while standing there in the nude, at the back door, feeling like someone's watching me, my dog starts barking this bark I have never heard before. Then he turns around and literally bolts upstairs. Usually, if I take him outside at night, he hangs around in the kitchen mooching for a treat. So this was unusual behavior. I'm officially freaked out now. So I slam the door, lock it, and bolt up the stairs after the dog. Once I get to my bedroom, I hear the screams again. So I was really concerned now, 
I'm trying to decide if maybe I should call the non-emergency police just to make them aware. And I decided if I heard anything else, I would call. But the night was silent after that. It may not sound much, but the combination of the vibes and the dog's behavior and the fact that it was so outside the normal nighttime sounds in the area just made it freaky. Back in about 2000 or 2001, I was driving by myself from visiting my mom in Colorado, back to Arizona. I was in a station wagon and had a desk my mom gave me that was my grandfather's. I have always been scared about driving at night that there was someone in the back seat that was going to get me. This might be because of too many scary stories or because my mom's paranoia rubbed off on me. I was in the army and drove back and forth a lot to visit her. She would get mad at me for sleeping at rest stops or gas stations and tell me someone was going to kidnap me and kill me. But I just didn't want to be bothered with the hassle and expense of a motel most of the time. I digress. So I was driving in an empty stretch of highway late at night with no other cars around me. Then this red truck comes up behind me, flashing his lights and honking his horn at me. I was thinking to myself that there was something wrong with my car. Or maybe there was something wrong with the desk in the hatchback. Because why else would someone be so insistent on me pulling over? So I pull over. I was in my mid-twenties and still a bit naive, and I get out of my car. As I'm getting out of my car, he's directly behind me, still flashing his lights and honking his horn. I got about to the middle of the car. I plan on going back there to see what could have been wrong with my car when it hit me. Why was he still honking at me when I was out of my car? That's odd. Then he gets out of his truck. That's when I knew something wasn't right. I jumped back in my car and sped off. The next exit was 45 miles or so away. He followed me the entire time. I take the next exit and go to a crowded grocery store with a laundromat next to it. There was an ambulance parked at the laundromat with its lights flashing and I was next to it. I figured there was an ambulance and eventually a police officer should come. The man stayed in his truck in the grocery store parking lot watching me the entire time. I was terrified. I didn't want to get out of my car and felt like an idiot if I would have to tell someone what happened. I waited about an hour and he finally left. After he left, I waited a little longer before continuing driving back to Arizona. I was paranoid and watchful for any red trucks the entire time. Fast forward five or six years. I was watching Unsolved Mysteries or some similar crime show with my hubby at the time. He knew what happened as we were dating when it happened. And what story pops up? One about a man on the exact stretch of highway with a red truck that used the same exact tactics to get a few women to pull all over and murder them. I am really glad my gut told me something was wrong and to get back in my car and drive. This was about 12 years ago, when I was in middle school, about 12 or 13 years old, so I might forget some details. We lived in the east side of our city, eventually became an area for project housing, which was pretty ghetto, and was known for gang violence and crime. We lived in another house before, only five minutes away, which got broken into while we were on vacation, so we gladly moved. My family, consisting of me in the middle school at the time, my little sister in 5th or 6th grade, my youngest sister in pre-K, and my two parents. I don't remember what time of year it was, or where my parents and my youngest sister were, but I was home alone with my other little sister. It was during the golden era of gaming. I was quick scoping on Search and Destroy in Modern Warfare 2 with some friends from school at the time this happened, and I think my sister was in her room when the doorbell starts ringing multiple times. I tell my friends in the Xbox party that someone is knocking, mute the TV door to look through the peephole. I see a woman, maybe in her late 20s, early 30s, white, dirty blonde, pacing around, waiting for an answer. 
She starts knocking on the door. I don't answer because stranger danger and continue watching until she leaves about 20 seconds later. I think nothing of it and go back to playing video games. About five minutes later, my sister runs into my room urgently whispers to me that she saw someone on the side of the house going towards the backyard. Our house was fenced off. I'm on high alert now and mute the TV again and headset after telling the party what's happening and head downstairs to check it out while my sister stays at the top of the stairs. I stay close to the wall in case there would be someone looking in the windows. The way the downstairs was set up, I could sneak to the wall adjacent to the backyard from the bottom of the steps without being seen. I start hearing a noise that sounds like Velcro if you slowly pull it apart. I peek ever so slightly to see the screen to the window being cut. I'm shaking now. I immediately sprint back upstairs as quickly as I can and tell my sister what's happening. Grab the house phone and hide in the closet. My adrenaline is rushing at this point and I'm not thinking right. I call my mom instead of the police and tell her what's going on. I don't remember what she said and if I still was on the phone with her or not so now the next part is hazy. We probably stayed in there for 10 to 15 minutes. I remember my sister staying in the closet when I went back out for some stupid reason to see if anything was happening. I'm still on the phone with either the police or my mom, probably my mom. Quietly rock through the hall towards the balcony, which overlooks the backyard. Open the sliding door and take a step out when I see two hands and a man's face, same age range as the woman. African American with a hoodie attempting to climb up the railing. We made eye contact for what felt like an eternity. It probably was only like five seconds. I was too shocked to scream or do anything. I think he was just as surprised to see someone was home because he lets go and falls landing on the ground pretty hard. Stupid 13 year old me walks further out to the balcony to see him and the woman that was knocking earlier hop the backyard fence and run away through the alley. I ran back inside. Next thing I remember was my parents being home and the cops eventually showing up to ask questions. I don't remember the reports or if they were caught or anything, but I assume this couple did it to the neighboring houses. Moving to the next if someone had to answer their knocks and rings and tried to rob the houses that didn't. It turns out all of the screens on the windows and the sliding door on the bottom floor were cut. Luckily, all the windows were closed and locked. We eventually moved again, but I wasn't left home alone for years after that, until I was about 16 or 17. I wonder what would have happened if I answered the door or if any of the windows were unlocked. Either way, we were pretty lucky. It was 2011, early December. I had a night class on the far side of the campus and because I lived right off campus, I decided to walk. And by walk, I mean use my crutches to do the weird crutch hop because I had a jogging injury. I first noticed them when I was walking through the main quad. They were lingering under a tree, almost invisible in the darkness. The two men were the only other people besides myself. Since my school turned into a ghost town after darkness because of the high crime rate in the area. They were about 100 feet away from where I was. And when I walked past them... They walked to a point behind me and began to follow me. They weren't carrying backpacks or bags. They weren't talking to each other. They were just wearing hoodies with the hoods pulled up. They simply followed me as I walked, hopping increasingly faster every minute across the rest of the quad, past the student union, across the street, through a shortcut, and down my street. When I was yards away from my house, I limp ran up my steps. I'd unlock the door. I turned around to look at them. They were still standing there on the sidewalk a few houses down, staring at me. When they saw me looking at them, they turned around and started walking back to campus. I love Facebook. I love memes. I love talking to new people. I love long comment sections. That being said, 
I never give away my personal information, such as where I work or live. My birthday info is also private. I've made quite a few friends that I didn't know personally, but agree with and had really good discussions with. On a friend's post for a while, it was no surprise when Tyler messaged me. It started off fairly simple. We just talked about the post we commented on. How do you do common interest? I was excited to have new friends. He seemed interesting and we had a lot in common. I'm not a beauty queen or anything, but I let him know after about an hour of casual conversation that I was taken happily. I enjoyed our friendship, but it wouldn't lead into anything more since I'm going to get married next year. He seemed a little upset, but respectful. I told him goodnight, went to sleep, thought nothing of it. The conversation continued for a few days. He started getting a little pushy if I didn't respond to him immediately. And I told him I'm very busy, so I may not always answer right away. And he apologized and told me he's just bored and lonely. I started to put a little distance because he didn't really back down, but I didn't want to give up completely on my new friendship because I hated the fact that he was so lonely. One day he randomly messaged me saying he wanted to have me in his arms. I immediately nipped that one in the bud, reminded him of my relationship and telling him if he didn't stop then our friendship would be done and I am loyal to my fiance about everything. He immediately loses his cool. Messaging me saying he didn't care about my fiance, making threats towards him. I stopped messaging him and selected to put his messages on ignore. He could still message me, but it wouldn't go into my inbox. I made a post about it and a friend of mine commented and said he had done the same thing to her, except he knew where she lived and would show up outside her house. I freaked out and went to go see if there was more messages from him because she told me he was bad news and I should call the police if any threats were being made. This is where the storm really begins. He messaged me over a dozen times, different things. Started off kind of taunting me for not answering. Then he moved on to messaging me about some jerk cut him off or was driving too slow for his taste. Then to him saying he was going to shoot that guy and it would be my fault because I made him so angry for ignoring him. I messaged him telling him to leave me the hell alone and stop replying for a while. He started messaging me narrowing down where I live. That really freaked me out as I had never told him where I lived or anything even remotely close to my house. The only thing I had ever said was I'll talk to him later because I was going into Arby's to get some food. Yet. Somehow he knew I was seven minutes from Arby's by my house, exactly how long it takes to walk there for me. And there are several Arby's in my city. Then he started narrowing down to what street I lived off of, down to knowing a four-door black sedan was linked to my address, which there was, but not in my name. It was in my sister's name when she registered it as an Uber. That was enough for me. I called the non-emergency line. The police refused to do anything, of course, saying until he actually showed up or did something, there was nothing they could do. Never mind that he was sending me pictures of dead people and saying that was going to be my family and was narrowing down my address. Unless he actually showed up, I was screwed. All I could do was apply for a protective order, so I did. Tyler kept messaging me. So I told him there was a protective order in place and he needed to leave me alone. He responded with there's nothing that could be done until he was served and signed it, which is true. My fiance is in IT and his cousin who is pretty tech savvy as well and managed to get the last couple of addresses Tyler had, but the police couldn't find him at either of those. We had license plate numbers addresses, full name, birthday, etc. Yet he seemed untraceable. He stopped for a while, but the day of my court case to have the PO extended to two years, he started again. My fiance filed criminal charges for threats he made. He said, someone could come shoot you in 15 minutes. His last known address was 15 minute drive from my house. I've spent the last couple of months completely afraid. He was arrested and served finally. I think he was speeding or something. And it turns out he has a history of this. Multiple charges. 
all dropped or dismissed. Done it to a couple of my friends who showed up to the court case for his criminal charges. They dropped everything from felonies to a misdemeanor disorderly conduct charge with 12 months suspended jail time depending on behavior. They couldn't prove it was him and not someone else behind the keyboard, especially with me never seeing his face in real life before this court date, even though I had two people who had received messages from him and seen him face to face as well. I can't sleep, the slightest noise wakes me up panicking. It's been hell for my family.